Welcome to Moo Moo Math and Science and the Life Science and Biology Year in Review. We began the year with the basic unit of life, the cell. In other words, the cell is considered the smallest thing that is alive. In order for something to be alive, it needs to have these six characteristics. It needs to be made of cells, contain DNA, respond to stimuli, grow and develop, reproduce, and require energy. The organelles of a cell work together to keep the cell alive. Let's take a look at them. The cell is alive, and the organelles must work together to keep it this way. Let's start with this large organelle called the nucleus. It is sometimes called the brain of the cell because it contains the instruction manual of the cell called DNA. Surrounding the cell is a cell membrane. It protects the cell and allows certain things to pass in and out of the cell. Here's what it looks like up close. A plant cell has extra protection from the cell wall. It gives plants a rigid structure and support. In addition, a cell has a cytoskeleton, which is a little bit like our skeleton. It is made of three types of proteins which work together to support the cell and to help with movement inside and out. You can see the cytoskeleton. They are in green and red fibers. See these tiny dots? They are called ribosomes. They get instructions from the nucleus and make building blocks for the cell called proteins. Here is a ribosome hard at work. They are found on the rough ER and in the cytoplasm. I'm standing on top of a maze looking at an object called the endoplasmic reticulum, also called the ER. You will find the ER near the nucleus. The ER makes proteins and lipids and breaks down toxic material and then transports these items to other parts of the cell. One place the ER delivers materials to is the Golgi complex. It is the red object I'm standing on. The Golgi complex repackages items and then sends them into a vesicle which go out to different parts of the cell. This organelle here called the mitochondria creates energy for the cell. It takes oxygen and glucose and creates energy to power the cell. Plants have these green organelles called chloroplasts, which take sunlight and carbon dioxide and water and create sugar and oxygen. The organelles float in a liquid substance called cytoplasm. It helps give the cell its shape and also contains important nutrients like salt and sugar that the cell needs. These lysosomes are important to the cell because they destroy old cell parts and help get rid of waste material. And finally, these vacuoles store food and water for the cell. A plant cell has a larger vacuole than an animal cell. So there is the team of organelles that help keep the cell alive. Living organisms can be made up of one cell which is called unicellular, or many cells, which is called multicellular. Life also has levels of organization. Cells make tissues, which make organs, which make organ systems, which make organisms. Let's take a look at these levels of organization. Cell is the basic unit of life. In other words, it is the smallest unit that is considered completely alive. Cells can be either eukaryotic, which means they have a nucleus and membrane-bound organelles, like the plant and animal cells, or prokaryotic, like bacterial cells, that do not have a nucleus. Next up is a tissue. A tissue is a group of similar cells working together. Examples include muscle tissue, epithelial tissue, or a nervous tissue. Then tissues make up organs. An organ is a system of tissues that work together that complete certain jobs within an organism. Common examples in us are the heart, the brain, the lungs, and the liver. Next, the organ system. An organ system is a group of organs that work together to perform bodily functions. For example, the cardiovascular system uses the heart, vein, arteries, 
and blood to transport oxygen throughout your body. Then all these organ systems work together to create an organism. It is a self-contained individual. Organisms can be unicellular, such as bacteria or an amoeba, or multicellular, like dogs, cats, and humans. These organisms make up a population, which is a group of the same species within a specific area. For example, this pack of dogs. A community consists of all the different types of species within an area and their interactions. For example, in this dog park, you have dogs, cats, birds. Finally, an ecosystem is made up of all the communities in a certain area, as well as the abiotic or non-living components in the environment. This ecosystem has dogs, cats, birds, trees, air, and other organisms. And finally, the biosphere is all the ecosystems on Earth. A cell needs to move materials in and out of the cell membrane. The cell membrane is considered semi-permeable and is a phospholipid bilayer. Semi-permeable means that certain objects can pass through the membrane and other objects cannot. A phospholipid bilayer means that the cell membrane is made up of two layers of phospholipids. A phospholipid has a head and a tail. The head is hydrophilic or water loving and is polar and the tail is hydrophobic or water fearing and is non-phobic. The tails point inward and the heads point outward. Smaller objects like oxygen and water can pass through the cell membrane. This occurs through diffusion or osmosis which is a type of passive transport. Passive transport does not require energy and occurs when objects move from a high concentration to a low concentration. For example, the mitochondria needs oxygen for cellular respiration and produces carbon dioxide which needs to move out of the cell. If oxygen has a higher concentration outside of the cell, it will diffuse or move into the cell. And if carbon dioxide has a greater concentration inside the cell, it will move out of the cell by diffusion. When water moves by diffusion, it is called osmosis. There is another type of diffusion called facilitated diffusion, which another molecule aids the movement of the molecules from high to low concentration. For example, some ions use a protein channel to move in and out of the cell. They are still moving from high to low, so it is considered tra passive transport, but it is considered facilitated diffusion because the protein channel is used. Sometimes a cell needs to move large objects in and out of the cell. One way a cell may do this is by endocytosis, which basically the cell engulfs an object in order to move the object into the cell. A large molecule like a polysaccharide can use endocytosis to be brought into the cell. Exocytosis is the opposite in which the cell moves objects out of the cell by pinching off a vesicle and moving the object out of the cell. And finally, another type of active transport which requires energy is a sodium potassium pump which uses ATP. Sodium ions inside the cell attached to the pump with the help of ATP, the pump changes shape and the sodium ions are released outside of the cell. Also two potassium ions on the outside of the cell attach to the pump and the pump changes shape and the potassium ions move inside the cell. They are going against the concentration gradient or going from low to high. divides during cell division which includes mitosis. Cell division begins during interphase when the cell makes copies of organelles and the DNA. Mitosis begins with prophase when chromosomes first appear. During metaphase, the nuclear membrane dissolves and the chromosomes line up in the middle of the cell. During anaphase, the sister chromatids separate and move away from one another. During telophase, the nuclear membrane forms around the chromosomes 
and the chromosomes unwind. This is the end of mitosis. During cytokinesis, two cells are created. Your integumentary system contains the largest organ in your body, your skin. In fact, it makes up 16% of your overall weight. But why is your skin important? First, your skin protects you by keeping water in your body and nasty pathogens and germs out. Your skin keeps you in touch with your outside world. Nerve endings in your skin let you feel things around you. Your skin helps regulate your body temperature. Small organs in the skin called sweat glands make sweat. And as sweat evaporates, it cools your body. Skin helps get rid of waste. And also it manufactures vitamin D. Skin comes in several colors because of a chemical called melanin. Melanin is important because it absorbs ultraviolet light from the sun. There are two main layers of your skin. First, your epidermis is the outermost layer of your skin. You see the epidermis when you look at your skin. Next, the dermis lies beneath the epidermis. And then there is a fatty layer called the hypodermis, which helps store energy because it's made up of fat. The epidermis is made of epithelial cells. Even though the epidermis has many layers of cells, it is only as thick as two sheets of paper. Next, the dermis lies beneath the epidermis and it has many different parts inside of it, such as blood vessels, which help transport substances, nerve fibers, which carry messages to and from your brain, hair follicles, muscle fibers, which are attached to a hair and help the hair stand up, oil glands, which help keep your skin flexible and waterproofs your epidermis, and sweat glands, which help cool you down. The layer beneath all this is called the hypodermis, and like I said, it is made up of fat and connective tissue. Your hair also, your skin also contains hair and nails. Hair helps protect your skin from ultraviolet light. And it also helps keep particles such as dust and insect out of your eyes and nose. Our body has approximately 700 muscles. These 700 muscles can be divided into three types, skeletal, smooth, and cardiac. Skeletal muscles are voluntary muscles, which means that we can actively control their functions. They are attached to our bones and they allow us to move. Skeletal muscles often exist in pairs, so when one muscle contracts, the other relaxes. Next, smooth muscles. Smooth muscles are involuntary, so they are not under our conscious control. They are found within certain organs, blood vessels, and airways. First, smooth muscles may facilitate the movement of blood by changing the diameter of the blood vessels. Smooth muscles may allow for the internal movement of food. And also, smooth muscles control the movement of air by changing the diameter of the airways found in our lungs. Cardiac muscles are found solely in the heart. They make up the walls of the heart and cause the heart to contract. They are involuntary muscles, so we never have to think about making our heart beat. There are certain fibers of muscles, striated, smooth, and cardiac. Striated fibers are skeletal muscles and they appear to be striped, so they are called striated muscles. Stri is a Latin term for meaning striped. Smooth muscle fibers are also called visceral muscle, and vis is Latin term for internal organs. It is a named smooth muscle because it does not have the striped appearance 
of a skeletal muscle. And then cardiac muscles are similar to skeletal muscles because cardiac muscles are striated. However, they are shorter than skeletal muscles and they usually contain only one nucleus. All muscles have four common characteristics. Contractibility, excitability, extensibility, elasticity. Contractibility is when a muscle shortens or contracts. Typically, as your muscle sh contracts, one of the bones will move and one will stay stationary. Excitability, for a muscle to contract and do work, its cells must be stimulated, most often by the nerves supplying them. Nervous impulses cause the release of a neurotransmitter, acetylchlorine, at the nerve muscle junction, and this activates receptors on the surface of the muscle cell, making the muscle contract. And finally, extensibility is the capacity to lengthen or stretch. Your muscle cells can be stretched to about three times their contracted length without rupturing. Elasticity means that the muscles can be stretched or contracted by some amount above or below its resting length without damaging it. It will return to this resting length once the stimulus for stretching or contraction is removed. And finally, do you know what really makes me smile? My facial muscles. The human skeleton is the internal framework of our body. At birth you have around 270 bones, but this decreases to around 206 bones by adulthood as bones get fused together. The human skeleton performs six major functions. Support, movement, protection, production of blood cells, storage of minerals, and endocrine regulation. Our bones give us structure. For example, without the structure of our bones, our lungs would collapse. Our bones work with the muscular system to help us move. The skeleton helps protect our vital organs from being damaged. For example, the skull protects the brain, the vertebrae protects the spinal cord, and the rib cage protects our lungs, heart, and major blood vessels. Blood cells are created in the bone marrow. Bones store calcium and iron, which are used in metabolism. Bones release a hormone, which contributes to the regulation of blood sugar. Bones are made up of several different layers. Cancellous bone, which is also called spongy bones, stores the red bone marrow where blood cells are made. Compact bone is hard and dense, and it gives strength to the hollow part of the bone. Periosteum is a protective layer where there is cartilage and the ligaments and tendons attach. And the marrow cavity contains the yellow bone marrow where white blood cells are made. So there we go, our skeletal system helps to protect, move, and produce. About three types of circulation found in the human body. Lymphatic circulation and two types of blood circulation. Pulmonary circulation and systemic circulation. Let's look at blood circulation first. Your blood is responsible for carrying oxygen, waste, sugar, and other important items throughout your body. In order to carry oxygen and eliminate carbon dioxide, it must travel to the lungs. Pulmonary circulation is when blood travels to the lungs and back. Blood enters the right atrium from the superior and inferior vena cava. It travels to the right ventricle and into the lungs through the pulmonary arteries. In the lungs, oxygen is exchanged for carbon dioxide at tiny air sacs called alveoli and then returns to the heart through the pulmonary veins. Up next is systemic circulation which is circulation throughout the body. As blood returns from the lungs, it enters the left atrium and then travels to the left ventricle, then passes out of the aorta and into the rest of the body. This circulation is called systemic circulation. There are three types of vessels that are used for blood circulation. 
An artery is a blood vessel that takes blood away from the heart to all parts of the body. Most arteries, but not all, carry oxygenated blood, and arteries are usually shown as red vessels. Veins are blood vessels that carry blood towards the heart. Most veins, but not all, carry deoxygenated blood from the tissues back to the heart. And finally, you have capillaries, which are tiny vessels that connect arteries and veins. The third type of circulation is called lymphatic circulation. The lymphatic system absorbs and transports lymph. Lymph is a clear fluid that is the result of plasma leaking out of capillaries. As plasma moves out of capillaries, some of it is not reabsorbed. You lose about three liters of plasma a day. The lymphatic system reabsorbs this fluid. Once this plasma has leaked out of capillaries and enters lymphatic vessels, it is called lymph. The lymphatic vessels have smooth muscles and valve that help move the lymph throughout your body. I'd like to talk about the immune system. Your immune system are the parts of your body that work together to keep you healthy. Up first is your skin. Your skin is your first line of defense. It is a protective barrier and keeps invaders out. Your body also uses tiny hairs called cilia and mucus in your nose and nasal passages to trap outside invaders. Next is the lymphatic system. This essential part of the immune system is a structure of lymphatic vessels and nodes which carry lymph throughout your body. Lymph is a fluid that leaves the capillaries and is collected and returned to the blood by your lymphatic system. This system helps the body discard toxins and lymphocytes found in this system help destroy pathogens. This symptom system has lymph nodes, which are pockets of tissue that act like a screening area for bacteria and viruses that may be in the lymph. Other important parts of the lymphatic system are the thymus and the spleen. The thymus, which is a gland located between your heart and breastbone, help create T cells. The T cells help direct battle against invaders and kill infected cells. Your spleen, which is located at the upper part of the abdomen, filters blood and searches for foreign cells and removes useless blood cells. It also fights against bacteria and other substances. Your bones also help fight disease. White blood cells and lymphocytes are created in the bone marrow of long bones such as your femur. Your immune system also depends on disease-fighting cells. Leukocytes, also called white blood cells or WBCs, are large cells created in the bone marrow that attack, engulf, and destroy invaders. They also signal our next type of cells, the lymphocytes, to help out in a battle against disease. Lymphocytes come in two main types, T cells and B cells. T cells help coordinate the attack and also kill infected cells. And B cells produce antibiotics which attack and bind to the pathogen. And also memory B cells remember the germ which helps the body respond quickly the next time the same germ invades the body. The body collects waste such as toxins, waste products, and carbon dioxide which result from metabolism in the body. The excretory system removes these toxins and waste. In addition, the excretory system regulates your amount of fluid and salts in your body. All of these functions help to maintain the homeostasis of your body. The components of the excretory system include your lungs, skin, and kidneys. The lungs primarily excrete carbon dioxide, which is a poisonous gas for the body. Your skin excretes water and salt when it sweats. The kidneys, however, are the major excretory organs in the body. There are two kidneys and they are bean shaped. They are important because they help filter out waste and salts from the blood. 
The kidneys are divided into two regions. The outer region is called the renal cortex, and the inner portion is the renal medulla. Each kidney contains over one million filtering units called nephrons. The renal artery transports blood to the nephrons. At the nephron, waste products like urea are separated out of the blood and collected. Red blood cells and other parts of the blood remain in the bloodstream. This waste product that is collected is called urine and travels down the ureter and is collected in the bladder. When you urinate, you get rid of this urine. The kidneys filter about 180 liters of blood, but only produce about 1.5 liters of urine. This process of filtration requires a lot of energy. The kidneys are only 1% of the body's weight, but use almost 25% of the body's oxygen. So there we go, the excretory system, the system that helps eliminate waste and toxins. The nervous system controls most of your daily activities by sending electrical signals up and down your body. Each of the following activities are controlled by the nervous system. The nervous system can be divided into two main groups, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system contains your brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral system are the nerves that extend throughout the body. Check out each system in the following picture. Your spinal cord, which is part of the central nervous system, receives information from the skin muscles of your body. It also carries nerves that control all of your movement. Your brain receives information directly from your body and the spinal cord. It uses this information to help you react, remember, think, and plan, and then sends out appropriate instructions to your body. The peripheral system is there to connect the central nervous system, which is the spinal cord and brain, to the limbs and organs. So therefore, it becomes a relay station between the brain the spinal cord, and the rest of the body. The peripheral nervous system can be divided into two minor systems, the somatic nervous system and the autonomic system. Whenever you dance, throw a ball, or go for a run, the somatic nervous system plays a role in controlling these movements. It controls voluntary muscles of your body. So when you decide to move a muscle, you're using the somatic part of your peripheral nervous system. The somatic nervous system contains two types of nerves or neurons. Sensory neurons carry information from the nerves to the central nervous system and motor neurons carry information from the brain and spinal cord to muscle fibers throughout the body. The autonomic nervous system controls internal body processes such as the following blood pressure, heart and breathing, body temperature, digestion, and many more. For example, whenever you breathe, your autonomic nervous system controls the breathing so you don't have to think about it. It also has two branches, the sympathetic nervous system which springs into action during emergencies and the parasympathetic nervous system that works when the body is at rest. Many times these two branches work in opposite ways. For example, the parasympathetic helps the heart beat slowly and the sympathetic system when called upon would cause it to beat faster. So there we go, the nervous system, how you control actions in your body. In this video, you will learn how the lungs and diaphragm work together to bring oxygen into the lungs and to move carbon dioxide out. The diaphragm is a large muscle that is found under your lungs. Your lungs are actually composed of millions of tiny air sacs and depend on the diaphragm in order to inflate and deflate. Your rib cage also helps out by having cartilage which allows the rib cage to expand and contract. When you take a deep breath, your diaphragm moves down and a low pressure area is created and air flows into your nose and mouth. 
As air enters the nose and mouth, it enters into the nasal passages. Your nose and nasal passages have tiny hairs called cilia and mucus that help filter out dirt and pollen from the air. The air next moves to the pharynx, which is located at the back of the mouth. From the pharynx, it moves to the larynx, which is commonly called the voice box. The voice box makes sound when air passes over the vocal cords. The epiglottis is a flap of connective tissue that covers over the larynx during breathing. It stands open during breathing to allow air into the larynx, but during swallowing, it closes to prevent choking on food. From the larynx, air travels to the trachea, which is a rigid tube made of cartilage. The trachea leads into two tubes called the left and right bronchus. These tubes continue to branch until you reach a tiny air sac called an alveoli. At the alveoli, oxygen diffuses into the capillaries and carbon dioxide diffuses into the alveoli and is exhaled. As you exhale, the diaphragm moves upward and carbon dioxide and some air flows out. So there we go, how the lungs and diaphragm work together in order to allow you to breathe. This is a study of how traits are passed from one generation to the next. Let's take a look at the following topics. Genes, chromosomes, traits, alleles, Punnett squares, selective breathing, and asexual reproduction. Gregor Mendel is considered the father of genetics. He was famous for studying pea plants. As he studied the plants, he noticed that for different characteristics like seed shape, there would be different forms. These characteristics became known as traits. Traits are characteristics that can be passed from one generation to another. A gene is a portion of DNA that contains the genetic code for the trait. Genes are located on chromosomes. Humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes for a total of 46. For each trait, you get some of the information from mom and some from dad. As a result, you may inherit different forms of the same trait. These different forms are alleles. Let's go back to Mendel and his pea plants. Notice that for each trait, there are different forms. The color of the flower can be white or purple. The pea plant can be tall or short. For all seven traits, each trait has a different form. These would be examples of alleles, different forms of the same gene. Let's look at an analogy. Think of an emoji. The trait is the emoji. The different forms of the same trait are the alleles. How about a couple more real life examples? Eye color would be the trait. The different forms of eye color would be the alleles. The trait is having hair. Having black or blonde hair is the alleles. Your height would be the trait. If you are six feet or five feet tall would be the alleles. Alleles, different forms of the same gene. What do these animals and plants have in common? They are all products of selective breeding. Suppose you want a variety of cows that produce a lot of milk. This is what you could do. Find the cows in your herd that produce the most milk. Only let these cows reproduce. After they reproduce, find the offspring that produce the most milk. Only let these reproduce. Keep re repeating this process until you achieve your goal of having cows that produce the most milk. The key here is to identify the feature you want and only breed from the individuals that have this key feature. Selective breeding is the process by which humans use animal and plant breeding to develop particular traits by choosing which animal or plant will produce and have offspring together. Selective breeding of both plants and animals has been practiced for many years. Key species such as wheat, rice, and dogs have changed significantly from their wild ancestors by selective breeding. Selective breeding was practiced by the Romans. 
Let's look at a couple examples. Look at these two dogs. The Chihuahua and the Great Dane shows a wide range of dog breed sizes using selective breeding. Look at this corn. The Teosinte looks very different than modern corn. This corn was produced by selective breeding. Take a look at the variety of carrots created by selective breeding. Sometimes selective breeding can produce harmful outcomes. Because the perfect racehorse needs to be both fast and light, selective breeding has focused, it, focused on thoroughbreds with huge muscles and light bones. Although thoroughbreds have become much faster over the years, they have also become much more fragile. So there we go, selective breeding, finding and producing the trait that we like. In this video, I'd like to talk about the basics of Punnett squares. And in this example, we will have two heterozygous parents. In order to solve a Punnett square, let's review some basic vocabulary. A trait is a characteristic that can be passed from one generation to another. An example of a trait would be eye color. An allele is a different form of the same trait. Having different eye color would be an example of an allele. Alleles are described as either dominant or recessive, depending on their associated traits. When solving Punnett squares, keep the following in mind. A dominant allele plus a dominant allele equals a dominant phenotype, and that would be homozygous because both alleles are the same. Dominant allele plus recessive allele equals a dominant phenotype. And this would be heterozygous because you have two different alleles. And then a res recessive plus a recessive allele equals a recessive phenotype. And that would be homozygous. A dominant trait is always written with a capital letter. A recessive trait is written with a lower case. Steps for solving and setting up a Punnett square. First, draw the Punnett square box. Next, write the genotype of the parents on the top and on the side of the Punnett square. Fill in the boxes and then determine the percentage of phenotypes, which is the physical expression of the trait. And remember, each box of the Punnett square is worth 25%. Okay, so let's cross two heterozygous flowers for this flower type, the color can be white or red. Use a Punnett square to determine the probability of one of their offspring having a white color. So let's draw the Punnett square. We will write the genotypes of the parents. I will look for information in the problem. Both flowers are heterozygous for red color. So I will use the letter T and I will write a capital letter and a lower case. Next, remember a heterozygous genotype is always a dominant trait. So both parents are written big T, little t because they are heterozygous. Next, I will fill in the boxes. So now let's see what color the flowers will be. Anytime you see a capital letter, this trait will appear and you will have a dominant trait. And the only time you receive recessive traits is when you have two lowercase letters. So we have dominant, 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 and then this is recessive. So the dominant is three out of four or 75% and the recessive is 1 out of 4 which is 25% so the answer to the original question would be 25% you'll have a white flower so there we go evolution is a theory that tries to explain why we have so much variety of life here on earth here is a definition a change in the genetic composition of a population during successive generations 
As a result of natural selection acting on the genetic variation among individuals and the development of new species. Hmm, that's a little confusing. So let's first break it down into its three main components. And you can see these here. Okay, I'd like to go into each part and say a word or two about each one. First, a change in the genetic composition of a population. Each organism has a genotype or the genetic makeup, and that leads to its phenotype, which is its physical expression. When Charles Darwin traveled to the Galapagos Islands, he saw finches, and they had different types of phenotypes due to their different genotypes. Mainly, on each different island, he saw beaks that were different. Next, successive generations means one generation after another. If you look at this picture, you have the original parents, then generation F1, then generation F2. So those are successive generations. Next, natural selection. Natural selection states that some organisms are better suited for their environment than others. They have a better chance of surviving and passing this genotype to their offspring. For example, they may be on an island where a narrow long beak may be superior to a flat beak. And finally, development of a new species. There are 13 species of finches found on the Galapagos Island. This is because on different islands, certain finches with their beak and the food supply were better suited for others. So here we go. Let's look at the components of evolution one more time. Charles Darwin, a naturalist, sailed to the Galapagos Islands. His voyage, which was originally supposed to last two years, lasted five. While at the islands, he witnessed the variety of life. He saw iguanas that swam and thrived in the ocean. Each island had a slightly different looking iguana. As he traveled to the different islands, he saw finches with different looking beaks. This voyage inspired him to write a book titled The Origin of Species. In the book he proposed his theory of evolution and attempted to explain the variety of life on earth. One mechanism he proposed to support his theory that life descended from a common ancestor was natural selection. Natural selection has several components. First is overproduction. Many organisms produce more offspring than can survive. For example, fish lay millions of eggs. A female sea turtle may lay 70 to 100 eggs, but only have a couple survive. A praying mantis lays 300 eggs and only one-fifth develop to adults. Next is variation. The offspring will have genetic variation. Take a look at these ducks. You can see the variation. They receive genetic information from mom and dad, which result in variations. Sometimes this variation may give an organism an advantage and allow them to have more offspring than organisms that do not possess this advantage. Up next is selection or death. Some organisms due to variation will be more fit to survive and reproduce than their environment and are more likely to pass their traits to their next generation. And finally, due to heredity, these traits can be passed from one generation to the next, which can result in changes over time. A classic case of natural selection is the peppered moth. In the 19th century, a pale or white peppered moth was much more common than a black peppered moth. However, people started to notice that it was actually the black form of the moth that was more common than the pale peppered form. Industrialism and coal fires had caused the air to become polluted and this killed off lichens and blackened urban tree trunks. So now it was the pale or white form of the moth that was more obvious to the predators while the black form was better camouflaged and more likely to survive and produce offspring. As a result, over successive generations, the black, black moths became to outnumber the pale or white moths. 
So there we go, natural selection, one way. How do we know that the Tyrannosaurus rex once roamed the earth? Or how do we study a mosquito that may be millions of years old? The answer is fossils. Fossils are the remains of once living organisms. In this video, I'd like to talk about several different types of fossils. Up first, mineralization. This is when an organism dies and is buried under sand and other sediments. Minerals in the water begins to replace the organism's original materials and will harden and become almost like a rock. For example, petrified wood is an example of mineralization. Next is carbonization. This occurs when an organism dies and is compressed. Over time, eventually, all that remains is a carbon outline of the original organism. Molds and casts are also important fossils. An organism will die, and you may have a bone or a tooth, and it will make an impression. And then this impression hardens so that you have a permanent record. This is a mold. Next, this impression can fill up and create a cast, which is a copy of the impression. Take a look at the mold and the cast. Sometimes you don't even have a record of the original organisms, but evidence of their behavior. You may find a footprint, or maybe an example where they crawl, or other types of tracks. These are called trace fossils. And then finally, you may have a copy of the original material. This may happen when you have a tiger, for example, that falls into a tar pit, and for thousands of years it is preserved. Or you may get an insect that is covered with amber, and it will remain in this amber for a very, very long time. So there we go, five different types of fossils and the remains of once living organisms. Symbiosis describes a close interaction between two or more different species. In this video, I will focus on three types. They are mutualism, in which both organisms benefit, commensalism, in which one organism benefits and the other is neither helped nor harmed, and parasitism, in which one benefits and the other is harmed, or maybe even killed. Okay, let's look at some examples of mutualism. First, each one of us has a personalized collection of bacteria called a microbiome living within us. This microbiome or bacteria break down carbohydrates and toxins. They help us absorb fatty acids and they also protect your cells and the intestines from invading pathogens. In return, the bacteria get a nice place to live and food to eat. Next, termites. Termites are nature's recyclers and they break down the cellulose of trees and decaying wood. However, the termites cannot digest this cellulose themselves. Instead, they depend on one-celled protozoa. These protozoa live in the stomachs of the termites, and in return, they get food to eat and a place to live. So it, again, it's a win-win. Next is commensalism. Remember, one benefits and the other is neither helped nor harmed. Hermit crabs live in the shells of once abandoned snails. This relationship helps the hermit crab because it gives them some protection, but these snails don't really care. Next, squirrels. They live and stay in trees for protection, yet the tree is neither helped nor harmed. Next, you have these tiny little mites, and they hitch a ride on flies. The mites are equipped with some type of method to grip onto the insect, and they get transported around. This phoretic mite is just a hitchhiker and does not feed during this time of being carried around. The mites receive transportation, but the fly is neither helped nor harmed. And finally, we have parasitism. One benefits, yet the other is harmed. Lampreys, which are these strange-looking primitive fish, have a very limited digestive system. They attach and feed on the body of other fish with more advanced digestive systems, and many times it will lead to the death of the host fish. This next one is 
falls under Life is Strange. A cuckoo, which is a bird, lays its eggs in a warbler's nest. The cuckoo young will knock the warbler's eggs out of the nest when they're born. And then the warbler will raise the cuckoo's young. Not very nice. So there we go. A a look at some types of symbiosis and symbiotic relationships. Object found inside this aluminum foil will help us understand a food web. Birds cannot chew their food. Instead, owls swallow their prey whole. But have you wondered what happens to the indigestible material like the bones? This material is compressed in the gizzard of the owl, and it looks like a little pellet. This compressed owl pellet is then expelled by the owl. Sometimes in science class, you may dissect this pellet to see what the diet of the owl consists of. You will find the bones of the animals that the owl has consumed, and this tells you how an owl receives energy. A food web is a diagram that shows the transfer of energy in an ecosystem. An ecosystem is a community of living organisms and the interactions between the biotic and abiotic factors. The biotic factors are the living components like the owl, and the abiotic factors are non-living items like the air and water. So let's create a food web of the owl to help understand this diagram. Here's an owl in its ecosystem. You will notice it is missing arrows, so let's start adding the arrows. First, an owl likes to eat rodents, like rats and shrews, and occasionally small birds. So let's add some arrows. The arrows point in the direction of the transfer of energy. The energy of the rodents is transferred to the owl, so the arrows are pointed in that direction. The bird's energy is transferred to the owl, so the arrows point towards the owl. The owl is considered the tertiary consumer because it is the topmost level and feeds on other carnivores. Now, let's see what the rodents eat. Rodents eat a large variety of insects, including grasshoppers, along with worms and snails. So the energy of these animals is transferred to the rodents, so the arrows point towards the rodents. Birds eat a large variety of organisms, including worms and also snails. The birds and rodents are secondary consumers because they consume primary consumers. Grasshoppers and snails are primary consumers because they eat producers like carrots, leaves of trees, and plants. They are considered primary consumers because they consume mainly plants, which are the producers. The plants are producers because they use sunlight to produce energy in a process of photosynthesis. As you move from one trophic level to the next, like from the plants to the grasshopper, only 10% of this energy is transferred. This is one reason why you always have a small numbers of birds of prey like the owl. It takes a large area to support a single owl. So the food web is a model that shows a transfer of energy in an ecosystem. However, in addition, there are decomposers, like bacteria and fungi. They are breaking down once living organisms, which recycle these materials. The plants, which, as you know, are producers, absorb these recycled nutrients, and this way the nutrients are returned to the ecosystem. And in this video, I will cover the desert, rainforest, taiga, deciduous forest, grasslands, savanna, and the tundra. Science. In this video, you will learn about the biome called desert. Although most people think of the Earth's deserts as wasteland, there is a large number of animals and plants that have adapted to the harsh conditions of a desert. In fact, one-sixth of the Earth's population live in desert regions. But what is a desert? Deserts cover more than one-fifth of the Earth's land, and they are found on every continent. A place that receives less than 10 inches, or 25 centimeters, of rain per year is considered a desert. If you take a look at this map of the Earth, you can locate areas that are deserts. The Sahara Desert is here. The Gobi Desert is found here. Arctic Polar. 
the great Victorian, to name a few. Many deserts are dry and hot, but there are cold deserts as well. The Sahara Desert in northern Africa is the largest hot desert in the world and reaches temperatures up to 122 degrees Fahrenheit or 50 degrees Celsius during the day. But some deserts are cold like the Gobi Desert in Asia and the desert on the continent of Antarctica. Desert animals have adapted ways to help either keep them cool and use less water. For example, camels can go for days without food and water. Many desert animals are nocturnal, coming out to hunt only at night in order to avoid the sun. Some animals, like this tortoise, will spend much of their time underground in a burrow. Other desert animals have adaptations to help keep them warm and survive in cold temperatures. This polar bear has thick layers of fat and fur for insulation against the cold and the white appearance is helpful for camouflage. The snowshoe hare has white fur in the winter and reddish brown fur in the summer, which means it is camouflaged from its pet predators for most of the year. Desert plants may have to go without water for long periods of time. Several plants have adapted by growing long roots that reach the water table underground. Other plants like cacti conserve water in order to stay alive. Plants in cold deserts grow close to the ground and close together which helps resist the effects of cold weather and to reduce damage caused by snow and ice particles driven by the cold winds. Some plants like lichens can survive on bare rock. Plants and animals in hot deserts have to survive extreme heat. Death Valley holds the record for the hottest temperature ever recorded at 134.06 degrees Fahrenheit. Plants and animals in cold deserts have to survive extreme cold. Average temperature of the Arctic polar desert is negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter. So there we go, a look at our biome called desert. Tropical rainforests are found around the equator. This biome is known for rainfall, warm temperatures year round, trees, and a huge diversity of living organisms. A tropical rainforest has trees, trees, and more trees. These trees create a canopy on top of one another. The vegetation is so dense that little light reaches the forest floor. Many of the plants in a tropical rainforest are evergreens, not deciduous. Many of these trees have very large vines. Tropical soils are deep, but they are strongly leached with large amounts of nutrients and minerals removed. This leaching causes the soil to lack many of the fundamental nutrients needed by the above ground vegetation. So how does the huge amount of vegetation exist if the soils are so depleted of nutrients? The answer lies in a very thin topsoil, made up mainly of decaying plants and animal remains. An amazing cycle exists between the huge body of vegetation above ground and this thin topsoil. As you can see from this climograph, rainfall is very high in a tropical rainforest and the temperature varies very little throughout the year. It rains often in the tropical rainforest. The rainforest has millions of different species of organisms. If you like insects, you will love the tropical rainforest. There are many different types of insects such as the assassin bug, a bullet ant, a longhorn beetle, and this leaf mimic katydid. Rainforests are also home to an incredible diverse range of animals and plants. Animals such as this anteater, this boa constrictor, this eagle, lots of monkeys like this howler monkey, lemurs, and very interesting frogs like this dart frog. Competition at ground level for light and food has led to some interesting evolution of plants. Some rainforest plants live on the branches of other plants or trees, or even strangle large trees to fight for survival. An example of this are orchids. 
Orchids comprise one of the most abundant and varied flowering plant families. Orchids are especially common in moist tropical regions. Although temperate orchids usually grow in the soil, tropical orchids are more often are epiphytes, which are plants that grow on trees or other plants, but are not parasites. Epiphytes take no nutrients from the tree itself, but instead relies on nutrients from the air, falling rain, and the compost that lies on the tree branches. So there we go, a quick look at the tropical rainforest. Rain, warm temperatures, lots of flowers, plants, and animals. Oh yes, some bugs also. In this video, you will learn about the biome called the taiga. The taiga is located in the north, but falls below the tundra. The taiga is also known as the coniferous forest or the boreal forest. This biome is the world's largest land biome, and it covers most of Canada, North America, and Alaska. It also covers most of Sweden, Finland, Norway, and parts of Russia. If you look at a climograph of the taiga, you will see that this biome has short, wet summers and long, cold winters. Precipitation is moderate in the taiga. It gets plenty of snow during the winter and adequate rainfall during the summer. The taiga has the lowest annual average temperature after the tundra, and it also contains permanent ice caps. The forests of the taiga are largely coniferous and contain spruce, fir, and pine trees. Coniferous trees keep their leaves throughout the winter and have needle-like leaves and this is well suited for the harsh temperatures of the taiga. The taiga also supports a relatively small range of animals due to the harshness of the climate. The taiga is home to a number of large mammals such as the moose, reindeer, and also some populations of deer. In addition, you may find gray wolf, a fox, brown bear, and occasionally a polar bear. Although the taiga has above average precipitation, the ground freezes during the winter months and the plant roots are unable to get water. The narrow needle-like structures found on the coniferous trees or its needles limit the water loss through transpiration, but also allow the plant or tree to practice photosynthesis. The shape of the evergreens also allows the snow to slide off the branches rather than pile up which can cause the branches to snap off. Some other examples of plants found in the taiga include the lichens, which are low and adapted for wind and ice and can even grow on rocks, cotton grass, which can carry out photosynthesis at very low temperatures in low light, fireweed, which is a flower that can produce up to 80,000 seeds at one time. So there we go, the taiga, a cold but nice forest. Science. In this video, you will learn about the biome called the temperate deciduous forest. The temperate deciduous forest is a beautiful biome famous for four seasons, and many of the trees in this forest lose their leaves each winter. Take a look at the deciduous forest. The deciduous forest can be found in the eastern half of the United States, Canada, Europe, parts of Russia, China, and Japan. The soils in the deciduous forest are very fertile. As a result, you will find broadleaf trees such as oaks, maples, beeches. You will find shrubs, herbs, and a large variety of other organisms such as insects, spiders, slugs, frogs, turtles, and salamanders. You will also find some birds like hawks, owls, and even woodpeckers. You also will find mammals there. Mammals such as white-tailed deer, raccoons, possums, black bears, and maybe even a red fox. If you take a look at the climograph for the deciduous forest, you will notice that this biome receives around 50 inches of rainfall a year and has warm summers and a moderate winter. 
A defining factor of this biome is four seasons. Take a look at the four seasons of a deciduous forest. The average rainfall in this forest is around 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Summers are between 70 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit and winters range from zero to around 50 degrees. So there we go, a biome known for four seasons, nice animals, moderate rainfall, and beautiful trees. In this video, you will learn about temperate grasslands. Temperate grasslands are large areas of mainly grass. Trees and large shrubs are almost absent in this biome. You can find grasslands in South Africa, Hungary, Argentina, Uruguay, Russia, and the plains of Central North America. Temperatures vary greatly in grasslands throughout the year with hot summers and cold winters. Rainfall is moderate. The amount of annual rainfall influences the height of grass. Taller grasses can be found in wetter regions. Grasslands also have seasonal droughts and occasional fires. The soil of the temperate grassland is deep and dark and very fertile. This is because of the growth and decay of the grass roots. The seasonal drought, occasional rains, and grazing by large mammals prevent woody shrubs and trees from invading and becoming established. However, a few trees such as oaks and willows grow in the grassland along with flowers. Precipitation in the temperate grassland usually occurs in late spring and early summer and averages around 20 to 35 inches. Summer temperatures can be well over 100 at times, while winter temperatures can be below freezing. There's many animals found in grasslands, including gazelles, zebras, rhinos, wild horses, lions, prairie dogs, hawks, owls, snakes, and of course some insects like grasshoppers. Grasslands can be further divided into prairies and steppes. Prairies are grasslands with tall grasses, while steppes are grasslands with short grasses. Steppes receive less rainfall than prairies and receive only 10 to 20 inches of rainfall a year. So there we go, the temperate grasslands, lots of grass, few trees, lots of animals, and very rich and fertile soil. Science. In this video, you will learn about the biome called the savanna. The savanna is a type of biome with large stretches of grasslands mixed with trees and shrubs. It is a mix between a tropical forest and a temperate grassland. Savannas have warm temperatures year round. There are actually two very different seasons in a savanna. A very long dry season in the winter and a very wet season in the summer. In the dry season, a savanna may receive only four inches of rain. The dry season is between December and February and has occasional fires. In the summer, it may rain often, and this biome may receive up to 10 to 25 inches of rainfall. Savannas are located in Africa, Brazil, India, and Australia. The savanna we are most familiar with is the East African savanna. This savanna is dotted with trees and shrubs. The Serengeti Plains of Tanzania are some of the most well-known. Here animals like lions, zebras, elephants, and giraffes are found. Many animals in the savanna have the ability to migrate. Many types of grasses exist in the savanna, and this biome is known for the acacia trees and baobab trees. Plants of the savanna have the ability to grow in this environment of long periods of drought. They may have long roots to reach the water table or thick bark to resist fires. Trunks that can store water and even leaves that drop during the winter to conserve water. Fires are an important part of the savanna. During the dry season, fires clear out old grasses and make way for new growth. Most of the plants will survive because they have extensive root systems which allow them to grow back quickly after a fire. 
So there we go, the biome called the savanna. Large animals, occasional trees, and grass. In this video, I'd like to talk about two types of tundra. The Arctic tundra and the Alpine tundra. The Arctic tundra is found in North America, Asia, and Europe, and circles the Arctic Ocean, and stretches southward down to the taiga. The tundra is cold, and during the winter, the temperatures can drop to minus 20 or even 30 degrees Fahrenheit. In the short summer, temperatures may rise as high as 50 or 60 degrees Fahrenheit, and this allows for the tundra to have life. The frozen soil of the tundra is called permafrost and has a frozen top layer almost all year. Plants in the tundra have a short growing season and are generally small, short plants. Examples include lichen, moss, and some shrubs. There are not trees in the tundra. There are many animals found in the tundra, including lem lemming, arctic fox, snowbirds, and a polar bear, along with grasshoppers and flies in the summer. They have adaptations to help them survive the cold. This may include a thick fur, or they may be white in color. The white color helps the animal blend in and helps prevent heat loss. The alpine tundra is a type of natural region or biome that does not contain trees because it is at a high elevation. As the latitude of a location approaches the poles, the elevation for the alpine tundra gets lower until it reaches sea level, and this tundra merges with the polar tundra. The alpine tundra is found above the tree line and also does not have any trees. Because of the higher elevation, the alpine tundra has a climate and rainfall similar to the arctic tundra, cold and dry with a short growing season. Some common examples include the Himalayas, the Pyrenees, and the Rocky Mountains. The vegetation of the alpine tundra includes grasses, clumps of moss, and low-lying shrubs. Because the alpine tundra is located in various widely separated regions of the earth, there are no animal species common to all areas of the alpine tundra. However, some animals that you may find include the mountain goat, chinchilla, and yak. So there we go, two types of tundra, the Arctic and the Alpine tundra. Oceans cover almost 70% of the Earth. Oceans are different than freshwater because they contain much more salt or salinity. In fact, oceans contain 35 parts salt to water, compared to freshwater, which is less than one part per thousand salt to water. Six kingdoms of life include bacteria, archaea, plant, animal, fungi, and protus. Two are prokaryotic, which means they do not have a nucleus, and this includes bacteria and archaea, and they are also the only kingdoms with 100% unicellular organisms. Four are eukaryotic, which means they have a nucleus, plant, animal, fungi, and protus. Plants are autotrophic, which means they get their energy from the sun. Animals and fungi are heterotrophic, which means they rely on other organisms for food, and bacteria and protists have both autotrophic and heterotrophic organisms. So there's your year in review. Thanks for watching, and Moo Moo Math uploads a new math and science video every day. Please subscribe and share.